Hi everyone, here we are for the last installment of Cultural Transformations, Religion and Science. And that focus will be a new way of think thinking, the birth of modern science. So let's start with the question of origins, why Europe? The Islamic world was the most scientifically advanced realm in the period 800 to 1400. China's technological accomplishments and economic growth were unmatched for several centuries after the millennium. But European conditions were uniquely favorable to the rise of science. It's an evolution of a legal system that guaranteed some independence for a variety of institutions by the 12th and 13th centuries. The idea of the quote-unquote corporation, which is a collective group treated as a legal unit with certain rights. And the autonomy of emerging universities. In the Islamic world, science remained mostly outside of the system of higher education. And Chinese authorities did not permit independent institutions of higher learning. And Chinese education focused on preparing for civil service exams. And there's an emphasis that was put on classical Confucian texts. Now, Western Europeans could draw on the knowledge of other cultures. The 16th through 18th centuries, for example, Europeans were at the center of a mass new information exchange. The tidal wave of knowledge that shook up old ways of thinking, an explosion of uncertainty and skepticism that allowed modern science to emerge, and the Reformation contributed by challenging authority, encouraging mass literacy, and affirming secular professions. Let's look at science as a cultural revolution. Dominant, edu educated European view of the world happened before the scientific revolution. The Earth is stationary and is at the center of the universe. The universe was of divine purpose. There's an initial breakthrough made by Nicholas Copernicus on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres in 1543. And he promoted the view that the earth and the planets revolved around the sun. Now other scientists built on Copernicus's insight. Johannes Kepler demonstrated elliptical orbits of the planets and Galileo Galilei developed an improved telescope and recorded observations of the cosmos. Sir Isaac Newton was the epigee of the scientific revolution. He formulated laws of motion and mechanics, and the central concept that universal gravitation applies everywhere. And natural laws govern both the micro and the macro cosm. Now, by Newton's death, educated Europeans had a fundamentally different view of the physical universe is not propelled by angels and spirits, but functioned according to mathematical principles. And the machine, or excuse me, quote, unquote, machine of the universe is self-regulating. And knowledge of the universe can be obtained through reason. And the human body also became less mysterious through cadaver research. Leaders of scientific revolution almost were entirely male. There were very few aristocratic women who participated informally in scientific networks of male relatives. And the Catholic Church strenuously opposed much of this thinking. The burning of Giordano Bruno in 1600 for proclaiming an infinite universe. Galileo was forced to renounce his belief that the Earth moved around an orbit and rotated on its axis. But no early scientists rejected Christianity. A church official's supported Copernicus. Galileo was undiplomatic in his dealings with the church. All right, Galileo on trial. The scientific revolution was predicated on the idea that knowledge of how the universe worked was acquired through a combination of careful observations, controlled experiments, and the formulation of general laws expressed in mathematical terms. There's new scientific instruments capable of making precise empirical observations that underpin some of the most important breakthroughs of the period. Perhaps no single invention produced more dramatic discoveries than the telescope, the first of which was produced, or excuse me, were produced in the early 17th century by Dutch eyeglass makers. The impact of the new instruments depended on how scientists employed them. In the case of the telescope, it was brilliant Italian mathematician and astronomer, Galileo Galilei, 1564 to 1642, who unlocked its potential when he used it to observe the night sky. Within months of creating his own telescope, which improved on earlier designs, Galileo made a series of discoveries that called into question well-established understandings of the cosmos. He observed craters on the moon and sunspots, or blemishes, moving across the face of the sun, which challenged the traditional notion that no imperfection or change marred the heavenly bodies. 
Moreover, his discovery of the moons of Jupiter and many new stars suggested a cosmos far larger than the finite universe of, universe of traditional astronomy. In 1610, Galileo published his remarkable findings in a book titled The Starry Messenger, where he emphasized time and again that his precise observations provided irrefutable evidence of a cosmos unlike that described by traditional authorities. With the aid of the telescope, he argued, this has been scrutinized so directly and with such ocular certainty that all the disputes which have vexed the, the philosophers through so many ages have been resolved and we are at last freed from worldly debates about it, end quote. Galileo's empirical evidence transformed the debate over the nature of the cosmos. His dramatic and unexpected discoveries were readily get grasped, and with the aid of a telescope, anyone could confirm the, their veracity. His initial findings were heralded by many in the scientific community, including Christoph Clavius, the church's leading astronomer in Rome. Galileo's findings led him to conclude that Copernicus, an earlier astronomer and mathematician, had been correct when he had advanced the theory that the sun, rather than the earth, was the center of the solar system. And that's known as the heliocentric uh, theory. But Galileo's evidence could not define it definitively prove Copernicus's theory to the satisfaction of critics, leading Galileo to study other phenomena such as the tides that could provide further evidence that the earth was in motion. When the church condemned Copernicus's theory in 1616, it remained silent on Galileo's astronomical observations, instead warning him to refrain from teaching or promoting Copernicus's ideas. Ultimately, though, Galileo came into conflict with church authorities when in 1629 he published what he thought was the consent of the church, the Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, a work sympathetic to Copernicus's sun-centric system. In 1632, Galileo was tried by the Roman Inquisition in an in ecl ecclesiastical court charged with maintaining orthodoxy and convicted of teaching doctrines against the express orders of the church. He recanted his beliefs and at the age of 69 was sentenced to house arrest. Although Galileo was formally convicted of disobeying the church's order to remain silent on the issue of Copernicus's theory, the question most fundamentally at stake in the trial was, what does it mean to know something? This question of the relationship between scientific knowledge, primarily concerned with how the universe works, and the other forms of knowledge derived from divine revelation or mystical experience, has persisted in the West. Over 350 years after the trial, Pope John Paul II spoke of Gallo's conviction in a public speech in 1992, declaring it had, quote-unquote, sad misunderstanding that belongs to the past, but one with ongoing resonance because, quote, the underlying problems of this case concern both the nature of science and the message of faith. Then the Pope declared scientific and religious knowledge to be compatible. There exist two realms of knowledge, one which has its source in revelation and one which reason can discover by its own power. The distinction between the two realms of knowledge ought not to be understood as opposition. The methodologies proper to each make it possible to bring out different aspects of reality. Strangely enough, Galileo himself had expressed something similar centuries earlier. Nor is God, he wrote, quote, nor is God, he wrote, any less excellently revealed in nature's actions than in the sacred statements of the Bible. Finding the place of new scientific knowledge in a constellation of older wisdom traditions proved a fraught but highly significant development in the emergence of the modern world. All right, here is the telescope. Uh, Johannes Hevelius, an astronomer of German Lutheran background living in what is now Poland, constructed an extraordinarily long telescope in the mid 17th century with which he observed sunspots charted the surface of the moon, and discovered several comets. Such telescopes played a central role in transforming understandings of the universe during the scientific revolution. So what does the development of the telescope show about European cultural and economic development? Well, the telescope demonstrates the cultural and economic in interconnectedness of Europe during the scientific revolution. It was an instrument developed and perfected in various regions throughout Europe that when employed for scientific purposes, led to numerous intellectual break breakthroughs. All right, science and enlightenment. The scientific revolution gradually reached a wider European audience. Scientific approach to knowledge was applied to human affairs. Adam Smith, for example, 1723 to 1790, formulated economic laws. People believed that scientific development would bring, quote-unquote, enlightenment to humankind. 
Immanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804, defined enlightenment as, quote, unquote, daring to know. European Enlightenment thinkers believed that knowledge could transform human society. It tended to be satirical, critical, open-minded, and inquisitive, and hostile to established authorities. They attract arbitrary government, the divine right of kings, and aristocratic privilege. John Locke, 1632 to 1704, articulated ideas of constitutional government. And much Enlightenment thought attacked established religion. In his treatise <clears throat> on toleration, excuse me, Voltaire, 1694 to 1770, attacked the narrow particularism of organized religion. Many thinkers were deists, belief in a remote deity who created the world but doesn't intervene. And some were pantheists, equated God and nature, and some even regarded religion as a fraud. The Philosophers of the Enlightenment. This painting shows the French philosopher Voltaire with a group of intellectual luminaries at the summer palace of the Prussian king, Frederick II. Such literary gatherings, sometimes called salons, were places of lively conversation among mostly male participants and came to be seen as emblematic of the European Enlightenment. According to this painting, what social class did Enlightenment thinkers belong to, and how can you tell? Enlightenment thinkers were elites who could afford an education and books and who had the leisure time to engage in them. Evidence of this is found in the image in which Voltaire and his fellow intellectuals dine around architectural and artistic finery, dress in expensive clothing, and have servants who wait on them. The role of women in society and their education were also topics of debate. Enlightenment thought was influenced by growing global awareness. Central theme of the Enlightenment was the idea of progress. Some thinkers reacted against too much reliance on human reason. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712 to 1778, argued for immersion uh, in nature rather than book learning. And the Romantic movement appealed to emotion ima and imagination. And there were also religious awakenings that made an immense emotional appeal. And quote-unquote enlightened religion fused faith and science. For example, Quakers and Unitarians. All right, European science beyond the West. The science became the most widely desired product of European culture. Chinese had selective interest in Jesuits' teaching. Most were interested in astronomy, cartography, and mathematics. Japan kept up some European contact via trade with the Dutch. Uh, there's an import of Western books that were allowed starting in 1720. A small group of Japanese scholars were interested in uh, Western texts, anatomical studies in particular. And the Ottoman Empire chose not to translate major European scientific works. Ottoman scholars were only interested in the ideas of practical utility, uh, for example, maps and calendars. The Islamic educational system was conservative and made it hard for theoretical science to do well. Looking ahead, science in the 19th century and beyond. A modern science was cumulative and self-critical. In the 19th century, science was applied to new sorts of inquiry. In some ways, it undermined Enlightenment assumptions. Charles Darwin, 1809-1882, argued that all, life, uh, all of life was in flux. Karl Marx, 1818-1883, presented human history as a process of change and struggle. Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, cast doubt on human rationality. And 20th century physics, such as re uh, relativity and quantum theory, questioned some of Newton's assumed constants. All right. Uh, the Virgen del Cerro, Virgin Mary of the Mountains, circa 1740. What is Mary's relationship to the heavenly being standing above her? God the Father on the right, the dove symbolizing the Holy Spirit in the center, and Jesus on the left, as well as to the miners at work in the mountain. What is the significance of the crown above her head and her outstretched arms? The heavenly beings standing above Mary illustrate that she is the one chosen by God to be the mother of Jesus. The presence of the miners show that she is a compassionate protector and intercessor on their behalf with Jesus and God. The crown might represent her status as queen of heaven, while her outstretched arms might represent her use of the status to help people on earth. 
Why do you think the artist placed Mary actually inside the mountain rather than on it while depicting her dress in a mountain-like form? Depicting Mary within a geological feature might be syncretic, reflecting pre-Christian beliefs that gods and spirits dwelt in mountains and other features in the landscape. Because of the positioning of her face on the mountain peak and her role representing the richly fertile silver mountain of Potosi, the artist may even be intentionally linking her with the earth mother goddess, uh, Pachamama, who was associated with mountain peaks and fertility. So what marks this painting as an example of syncretism? Well, the depiction of Mary within a mountain might reflect pre-Christian beliefs that gods and spirits dwelt in mountains and other features in the landscape, as I mentioned earlier. And given the positioning of her face on the mountain peak and a rope representing the richly fertile silver mountains of Potosi, the artist may be intentionally linking her with that mother goddess. All right, illustration of the Annunciation, circa 17th century. What specifically Chinese elements can you identify in this image? A lone tree and a scholar rock, quote-unquote scholar rock, in the background were typical of Chinese landscape painting. The house and furniture suggest the dwelling of a wealthy Chinese scholar, and the reading table in front of Mary was a common item in the homes of the Chinese literary elite. The clouds that appear at the angel's feet and around the shaft of the light are associated with sacred Buddhist and Taoist figures. And the European engraving on which this Chinese print was modeled included in the background the scenes of Jesus' crucifixion. Why might the Chinese artist have chosen to omit that scene from this image? The European engraving, uh, excuse me, um, China might not have a tradition of depicting events that were separated in time and space within the same image. A more traditional Chinese landscape scene would be more familiar to the viewer. The Holy Family, circa 17th century. Let's analyze the artist's purpose. Why were the members of the Holy Family portrayed as South Asian elites? Well, by presenting a syncretic vision of Christianity, especially one that depicts an elite Chinese livelihood, the author aimed to assist in the Christianization of Chinese elites through a recognized intellectual framework. And this concludes our study of a new way of thinking, the birth of modern science. I will see you guys for uh, chapter 16.